Lembramos a todos de permanecerem com seus celulares no modo silencioso. Daremos início, neste momento, ao painel 4, Sustentabilidade na Indústria do Aço. Convidamos para subir ao palco os senhores Frederico Aires Lima, Conselheiro do Aço Brasil e Diretor-Presidente da Aperan South America, que será o moderador do painel. Os senhores palestrantes Michael Browngard, CEO da EPEA, Environmental Protection and Encouragement Agency, e professor da Leofana University, Lundburg. Peter Levy, analista de tecnologia de energia da Agência Internacional de Energia. Informamos a seguir as regras de funcionamento do painel. O moderador do painel terá dez minutos para suas considerações iniciais. Cada um dos palestrantes terá um tempo de exposição de 30 minutos. Ao final das apresentações, haverá sessão de debates, devendo as perguntas serem formuladas por escrito e entregues às recepcionistas. Com a palavra, o moderador Frederico Aires Lima. Pessoal, boa tarde. Bom, estamos chegando aí ao painel do, ao último painel do dia. É um painel que eu tenho a honra de presidir. Eu acho que por dois motivos. né? Primeiro, a hora que a gente fala de sustentabilidade, é, a gente está garantindo o amanhã pensando no presente ou fazendo o presente pensando no amanhã. Eu acho que isso tem que ter para nós um valor, já que a gente está falando das gerações futuras, dos nossos filhos, dos nossos netos. É, o outro ponto, o primeiro motivo seria esse. O segundo é que eu acho que a gente acabou ao longo do dia aí falando de excesso de capacidade, de crise, de problemas que nós temos que resolver. E eu acho que, é, para todos nós do setor, compartilhar um pouquinho do nosso relatório de sustentabilidade e falar desse tema, eu acho que a gente tem mais notícias boas do que ruins. É, não que esteja tudo ótimo, não que esteja tudo perfeito, eu acho que hoje a gente está melhor do que ontem, mas espero que a gente esteja hoje pior do que vamos estar amanhã. É, mas a maior parte das notícias, as coisas que a gente compartilha, são a maior parte delas boas. É, uma delas que eu queria lembrar na indústria do aço, o primeiro ponto é a sucata. O que é a sucata nessa indústria? Né? A sucata de aço já é o produto mais reciclado no mundo. É, você produzir aço a partir de sucata, reciclando sucata, produz um aço exatamente igual ao que você produz a partir de matérias-primas, o que difere bastante de outros produtos, principalmente o plástico, em que essa reciclagem não é, é infinita. Né? É, o aço tem essa particularidade. Outro ponto que eu acho que a gente não pode esquecer, e aí é um privilégio do Brasil, é uma, eu vou falar o termo jabuticaba aqui, os dois não vão entender muito bem, mas, bom... É, só o Brasil tem a particularidade de produzir aço a partir de carvão vegetal é da forma que nós produzimos. É, eu acho que, no geral, de forma muito sustentável, os senhores vão ver pelo relatório a maior parte de florestas próprias, então, realmente uma coisa sustentável, é, mas que não serve para a grande magnitude da produção siderúrgica, é, isso é muito adequado para as empresas de escala, aí, até um milhão de toneladas, que se são mais ou menos a ordem de grandeza das, das indústrias de aços especiais. Né? Para o grande volume de aço, realmente, a rota do coque ela é, a, é a única viável. É, além disso, a recirculação de água também está muito clara no relatório, é um ponto de se orgulhar, a gente chega aí ao redor de 96% da água que nós utilizamos no processo é reciclada, é, re, é reutilizada, né? então isso aí também é ponto de, de orgulho nosso. É, geração interna, nós geramos, nós como setor, geramos boa parte da energia elétrica que consumimos, é, isso é feito através da utilização de gases que são utilizados em outros processos do, do próprio, da produção de aço, mas também na geração de energia. É, por fim, o uso de coprodutos. Eu acho que isso aí também é um ponto que a empresa sempre trabalhou. Grande, a maior parte dos nossos é, produtos são reutilizados, alguma coisa em nossa própria indústria, uma grande parte na indústria cimenteira e de pavimentação. É, isso também acho que a gente pode ver. Então, assim, esses pontos que eu comentei aqui, eles estão muito claros no nosso relatório. Essa edição do relatório de sustentabilidade do setor é a 11 A gente vem fazendo esse relatório a cada dois anos. É, e o que sai desse ano aí, ele já sai com a modernização que dois anos 
permitiram, né? ele já é acessível em todas as plataformas, telefones, tablets. É, eu, para fazer o painel, claro, estudei o relatório e vi como que ele realmente está muito mais, mais agradável de navegar, muito mais atualizado. É, lembrar que isso é um é pioneiro, o setor é pioneiro no, na emissão de um relatório como este do setor, ou seja, ele congrega nós todos, é, poucos setores hoje, ou vários já fazem, mas quando iniciamos, é, isso era, era uma, uma novidade, foi um pioneirismo de, desse, desse setor nosso. Então, assim, não vou falar do relatório, vou pedir que coloquem o vídeo que, que nós temos aí, ele faz um breve resumo do relatório, aí depois eu volto aqui e a gente inicia as palestras. Por favor, o vídeo... Então, é, um resuminho do nosso relatório, e eu vou passar, então, para as palestras aqui, é, lembrando que as perguntas devem ser feitas por escrito, e entregue às nossas recepcionistas, que nos entregarão aqui, a gente, quando for o debate, nós iniciamos. Então, eu gostaria de passar as palavras aqui ao, ao nosso primeiro palestrante, o senhor Michael Braungarten, por favor. The floor is yours. Good afternoon. Uh, so, um, I, what I will say will be a little more controversial than the things which we heard before. And if you feel somehow angry about it, it's not because of the translation, because the translation is exquisite, but maybe I, uh, yeah, I'm a little exhausted because I came in this morning at four o'clock. Yeah. Uh, and I make it quite easy for you Uh, to not to accept what I'm saying, because look, I'm definitely the person with the worst haircut in this room, so somebody who is not able to find a haircut in time is definitely not, not doesn't have a lot of credibility. So I, I want to inspire you. No, I, I don't want to tell you the truth, whatever. I want to show you how we can use 40 years of environmental debate as an innovation engine, as an opportunity And this is where uh, I'm not talking about sustainability, really, because sustainability is quite boring, isn't it? If I ask you, how is your relationship with your husband? What do you say? Sustainable? Yeah. <laughs> Then I'm really sorry for you. Yeah. Though you better join me for that. Yeah, so. um, and as well, it's not about environmental protection like we talk it traditionally. People think it's environmental protection when they recycle some water, if they reduce some energy. Yeah. But it's, it's not protecting, it's only minimizing damage. It's like if I beat my child five times instead of ten times, I'm not protecting my child. I'm only minimizing damage. And for that, we are too many people on this planet. And I, I'm here with my colleague, Leah Geyer, and I, she works with me for many years now 
here in, in Sao Paulo. And it's not that I'm just flying in and I'm leaving. No, I'm, I was here at least 30 times already and we have a lot of activities in Brazil because first of all, Brazil is one of the most beautiful countries in the world. And secondly, Brazil has the nicest people in the world. So it's, I really enjoy to be here. And so let's talk from a family perspective. And when I'm criticizing things, it's from a family perspective with a lot of sympathy because definitely steel is a smart material, but it needs to be handled differently. And sure, we can use steel for a lot of beautiful things. You know, it's not about just being a little less bad. It's about really making beautiful things. But when you're talking about a car being carbon neutral, <laughs> this is just a joke. Yeah? If you see, Brazil is one of the hotspots of soil erosion. When you grow sugar cane, you're losing between 5 and 16 tons of topsoil per hectare in a year. Yeah? This is not carbon neutral because the biggest part of carbon is in topsoil, not in oil. Yeah. So, but there are other countries which are much worse here. Yeah. The rainforest in, in Malaysia, they're cutting it down to make palm oil. Yeah. And one hectare of, uh, of rainforest has 7,000 tons of carbon. One hectare of palm oil plantation has 70 tons. And we, in Europe, we use 3 million tons of palm oil as biodiesel. Yeah. How ridiculous. Yeah. So it's... Here, there is the carbon, it's in soil, not in oil, yeah, just when you want to be carbon neutral. But carbon neutral, is it really, make, does it man, make sense? If I think about it, I come home and say, I'm child neutral. Yeah. <laughs> no, I want to be good for my children, isn't it? So carbon neutral, did you ever see a carbon neutral tree? A tree is always carbon positive, not neutral. Yeah. So don't really want to be positive. But I want to show you first some strong points about steel. Look, this is the off-casing of a washing machine. And what it's off-casing, it's not steel, it's the plastic which is off-casing. So why do we, it's nice to see that picture about this cheap, yeah? <laughs> but it's mostly cheap plastic, yeah? which is stinking. Yeah? So, and steel is not stinking. And, and when you talk about lightweight steel, but the reality is steel is more and more replaced by plastic. Yeah, and steel is more and more replaced by aluminum, and steel is more and more replaced by carbon fiber because you're not doing your homework at all. And I want to show pictures of that. But first, you see other things which are stinking. So when you pe pe try to save energy, this carpet is off-gassing dramatically. Here, another example. They think it's a natural fiber, but actually, the sheep is not designed for the carpet. And so when you make a red wine resistant sheep, yeah, designed for a carpet, God didn't do this. So it's a lot of chemistry. It's Teflon, it's a Teflon carpet, and it's off-gassing, it stinks dramatically. The indoor air quality in the building is about three to eight times worse than outside urban air. And it's not because of the steel, it's because of the plastic and the glues. So you have a lot of potential. Flame retardants are the fastest growing peak we find in human milk, in mother's milk. Yeah, and you don't find steel in human milk. Yeah. We see plastics in here with heavy metals in it. You see them with nickel, arsenic, cadmium, antimony, tellium, etc. It's amazingly primitive. We find 600 toxic chemicals in, 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 in children's toys. The European Union is just banning 64. So we have 10 times more toxic, toys in, uh, uh, toxic chemicals in toys, and it's not the steel. Yeah. But coming to your business here, it's now about efficiency. When I was a child, a cow was producing uh, 5,000 liters of milk in Europe. And I thought this is a lot. Today, I'm teaching in the Netherlands, we are up to 20,000 tons, uh, 20,000 liters per cow. Shall I squeeze another 1,000 liters out of this poor cow to be more efficient? When you make the wrong things perfect, then they are perfectly wrong. Yeah. The real environmental protection in the past, in Poland, for example, compared to France, was by inefficiency. So don't optimize the wrong things, otherwise you're perfectly wrong. Yeah. Um, here, traditionally, we think from cradle to grave, and we think it's environmental protection when we build landfills. But we are not protecting, we're only trying to minimize damage. Look how primitive we are from 41 chemical elements we find in a mobile phone. Yeah, we just recycle nine of them, and all the rare ones, the indium, the gallium, is not recycled at all. This is primitive downcycling. It's just a shame for all engineers in this room that we can do this to our planet and to our children. How can we be so stupid? 
you know, all the rare stuff is not recycled. A little, a little gold, a little silver, a little aluminum, a little iron, yeah, but it, it's a real thing is not recycled, yeah. Or it gets worse. If you have a Mercedes, for example, a Mercedes has 46 steel alloys in it, yeah. 46, yeah. <laughs> and guess what they make out of it? And they call it recycling, they make building steel. How can you be so stupid? Yeah, how can you, it's like if you make a, a, a nice cow into hamburgers, yeah. How can we be so stupid? Because we lose all these rare elements. All the nickel, all cobalt, manganese, molybdenum, vanadium, palladium, chromium, copper, titanium, bismuth, antimony, etc. is all gone. It's all diluted in building steel. And we call it recycling? How primitive. <laughs> this is the most stupid things you can do. Yeah. And, so, and then we, we, we talk about recycling because these things are far more rare than iron. And it's critical. I was in Turkey in 99, and there were 20,000 people killed in an earthquake. Yeah. And we found up to 2.2% of copper in this building steel. We're just analyzing the Italian bridge, and we find more than 1% of copper in the steel there. Yeah. If, as you know, when you have more than 0.5% of copper in the steel, the steel gets brittle. It breaks like an osteoporosis bone. Yeah. Yeah, we are talking about corrosion, but we are causing the corrosion by primitive recycling. Yeah. And this is not a recycling, this is downcycling. Yeah. So how can we be engineers and proud of what we are doing when we do this primitive recycling? The earthquake was not strong. Yeah. I was there for the European Union. It only was 4.6, the earthquake. And why was it in, in 99, United States were exporting 4 point, uh, 7 million, 7.1 million used cars into Turkey because it's illegal to do building steel out of uh, a, a recycled vehicles in the United States because of the earthquake risk in San Francisco. This is why they ship it and one to one they make building steel. What do we do in Europe? <laughs> we are diluting the, the, the recycled vehicle steel with virgin steel and, and to get the copper concentration down. Yeah. But we lose all the rare elements as well. Yeah. How sick? This is what we do. We try to minimize, re reduce, avoid. It's all guilt management. It, and the sustainability tells your customer, if you don't buy it, it's even better. Do you really need it? <laughs> no. Let's make, talk about not efficiency, but about effectiveness. Let's talk about how to make things which are good, not less bad. If I beat my child only five times, is it really good? No, it's just a little less bad. So we talk about making a beneficial footprint, not minimizing damage. It's good to save energy. All in co uh, this is eco-efficiency. But uh, why don't we make things positive? Why don't we make a beneficial impact? We are the only species in the world which make waste. How can we be so stupid? We are more stupid than any other animal on this planet. Yeah, no other animal makes waste. So we need to think about nutrients being good. Look at the cherry tree in spring. No reduction, no avoidance, no minimization, but everything is beneficial. Everything is in nutrition. Using the right energy sources and celebrating diversity. This tree is completely inefficient, but very effective. Yeah. So everything becomes a nutrient. Everything what gets consumed, like shoe soles, like brake pads, like, like carpets needs to go to the biosphere. Everything what is just used as a service needs to go to the technosphere. So it's no longer about sustainability, it's about quality, beauty, and innovation. So let's talk about how we make things differently. And look at the cherry tree in spring. Here is a little video which explains it a little bit to us. Look at, look at the cherry tree in spring. No reduction, no avoidance, no minimization. But all the materials are beneficial. The cherry tree only makes a handful of cherries, actually but with hundreds of blossoms. And all the materials are designed to go back into the biological system. I think we're not too many. It depends what those nine billion people are doing. The cherry tree makes soil, makes oxygen, cleans the air. It's not toxic, it's not dangerous. No, it's the opposite. It's all nutrition. And what we do, we make the wrong things perfect, and then they are perfectly wrong. If you think about ants and termites, there's four times as many, but they don't cause the problems because they produce nutrients and not waste. They convert biomass into nutrients, so why shouldn't we be able to do the same? 
cradle to cradle divides products into two spheres, a technical and a biological one. We have to redesign products. On the technical side, we have materials such as metals that can be used forever, like in chairs and wash machines. The biological side, we have products that dissolve back into nature, like cosmetics or the natural fiber textiles. If these two three stay separate, the concept of waste will be obsolete. So instead of reducing our footprint, let's rethink for a positive footprint. Cradle to Cradle now becomes a friendly tsunami. Yeah. And hundreds and hundreds of young designers are doing Cradle to Cradle now. I want that the money I give for a product brings positive impact for the society. I'm optimistic because I think everything is going in that direction. It's never too late to stop to make stupid things. Yeah, watch <laughs> your head turns full circle. I just wanted to show you the video that I can have another haircut as well. So. <laughs> So everything is designed to the biosphere or the technosphere. There is no waste anymore. And it's not about zero waste. When, because when you talk about zero waste, you still think about waste. Yeah? When I tell you, don't think about a pink elephant, you think about a pink elephant. Yeah? Yeah, so this is why I talked to you about everything being nutrient. And steel is the ideal technical nutrient. Why don't we use it more for packaging? Why don't we use it more for vehicles? Because the industry is too primitive. Like it was said this morning, it's low quality if, yeah, exports. Instead of understanding steel as a technical nutrient, and there is opportunities for that. So let me give examples for other areas, like the biosphere. This is the first toilet paper designed for the biosphere, really can go into biological cycles. Now we can make printing that which, which allow to be composted. Normally, if you have a catalog, it, it's a paper so toxic that it cannot be burned in a fireplace or it cannot go into recycling. So there is endless to do. These are the first shoe soles with Puma, yeah, to, which are designed for the biosphere. The first compostable T-shirts, the first plaque, which is designed for skin. So we see this in the biosphere, it's happening. Yeah, we see this for cosmetics, we see this for cleaning products, all cradle to cradle. But steel is a material for the technosphere because it doesn't get consumed, it's a service. So basically, why don't you sell steel insurance instead of selling steel? Yeah. Because nobody needs the steel, you need the service of the steel. Here you see, for example, we work with Carlsberg, for example, on packaging. This could be a steel can. It doesn't need to be aluminum but it needs to be designed differently for that. I want to show you that in 2020, Maersk, which is the world's largest logistic company, will do only ships as cradle-to-cradle -cradle ships, technical nutrients forever. Then you could do shipbuilding in Brazil because it's a technical nutrient management. Yeah. And you see for Mercedes, the material costs are much higher than labor costs. So if you handle materials differently, you can make a difference for that. Oh, excuse me. I need that back. Huh? Can I have that? Mask line. Maersk Line will implement the most comprehensive cradle-to-cradle -cradle passport ever seen for the new giant triple E ships. The cradle-to-cradle -cradle passport will identify each and every nut and bolt of the giant 60,000 ton ships, making vastly improved recycling possible for most materials as well as safe disposal for the rest. The materials of the ships will all be marked and numbered separating high and low grade steel, copper wiring, hazardous materials and waste. Based on the sorting, it will be possible to reuse nearly all materials for new ships, making dangerous and polluting scrapping a thing of the past. Ships. So why don't we make cruise ships here? Yeah? 
and we make them as services. 35 years of using the material as a service. So this would be innovation. This would generate jobs, yeah? instead of putting scrap yards in Bangladesh. Yeah? This is ridiculous. It's an abuse of the material. Yeah? So let's talk about how carpets, for example. We can, we can now make carpets. You're no longer selling a carpet. You're selling a floor packaging insurance for 10 years. So you can use the best material, not the cheapest thinking stuff. We can make carpets which clean the air instead, instead of just not stinking. Yeah. So actively absorbing fine dust. We have a lot of these things. We can make furniture. Steelcase is the world's largest maker of office furniture, big in this country as well. Uh, the, the, the chairman of, uh, of Steelcase for 21 years is now the CEO of Ford Motor Company. Why don't you want to do a cradle-to-cradle -cradle car with cradle-to-cradle -cradle steel here? Jim Hackett runs it, and, and, and Bill Ford is the chairman of the company, and we can do this with steel case. You're no longer selling a chair. You're selling, selling healthy sitting insurance for 10 years here. So you can use the best steel, not the cheapest stuff. Yeah. So we have a lot of building materials now related to cradle-to-cradle. -cradle. They need different coatings. Look, right now, the secondary smelters of steel are the biggest single sources of pollution in the whole industry. There's no other industry which is so dramatically poisoning the environment because all the coatings on steel are never made for recycling. How can you allow your high quality steel material to be coated with stupid toxic paint? Yeah. Why do you do this? Yeah. There's no need. So we have been doing this. We can make buildings like trees, buildings which support life instead of minimizing damage. Uh, we can make buildings like a buffalo, yeah? and the bones would be the steel. So it's a service where it can be used. We can, we can do architecture with that. We can do this, we do this in China on a big scale because we can now basically make more space by the buildings than we have before. We can reuse the walls as well for that. So we can make happy, healthy schools. When, when you celebrate children right now, we say, hey, it would be better you would not exist. We talk about overpopulation. No, let us pe look at people and say, how nice that you're here. Not could you be 10% less evil. Yeah. So when you do so, the vandalism in these schools go down dramatically. Uh, we can show, thanks to steel construction and wooden construction, yeah, not to plastic, yeah, that the indoor air quality can be better than outside air. You can see this in Fenlo in the Netherlands, a building which supports it. You can go there and you can see it. You can measure it. So we can make buildings as material banks. Yeah. So why should you sell the steel instead of selling just the steel structure for a certain period of time yeah, as a service? And then you could use far better steel. Think about a car. Right now, we have 46 steel alloys in the car. We could make the same car with five alloys. And 90% of this car doesn't need plastic. It doesn't need aluminum. It doesn't need carbon fiber. Could be made with one single steel alloy. And what you can do, it will be more expensive, but you could give the, the, the steel alloy to an investor. An investor holds the steel for 15 years in the car. It would make a Mercedes $6,000 cheaper to make. Because you're not consuming the steel, you're only using it as a service. You can make the same in a building, and you can make the same in a cruise ship. It's only a service. And my colleague from Klöckner showed you how this really works by combining digital world with real service management of steel. Why do you sell steel when people don't need the steel? They need the service of the steel. And it's a big project here. So we need material passports. So how many buildings do we have in Brazil which have a material passport that you know what material you have in there where you can specify the alloy for that? So you could take and make a steel. Let's think about a car made out of stainless steel. Yeah? And the steel belongs to an investment fund. So you don't need to sell it. You'd only sell the service of a stainless steel car. Then you would high quality steel and the steel could be used forever. Yeah? And the ones who want to keep the, the car just pay the extra $6,000. Yeah? But why should you? 
you make reversible building design, you need the data management resources with Glöckner, we need brick business models, we need policies and standards, and we need case studies where I gave you some examples already. But we are at the very beginning. If people think if you cannot make things digital, if you don't know what it is. When your steel is a wild mixture of rare elements, yet just being diluted in steel, how can you make it digital? No, you need to know what it is. Yeah? So, but but your, we see this everywhere. I was at BMW, yeah, one of the most advanced car companies. Do you know? <laughs> they use carbon fiber and they don't know what to do with it. It's like if you're designing a, a, an airplane yeah, and you let it start without having an ability to land. Yeah? So they make these electric vehicles with carbon fiber. How ridiculous. Yeah? So steel would be the ideal material, but it would be an alloy which would much lower weight, higher costs at the beginning, but it would be a permanent service. So I was at the factory of the future of BMW. Yeah? And can you imagine they buy robots? <laughs> can you imagine how can people, people be so stupid to buy a robot? Nobody needs a robot. I need welding points. Why don't you buy 100 million welding points instead of buying a robot? People buy solar panels. Nobody needs a solar panel. Why don't you buy just 20 years of harvesting photons? Then you can use the best materials, not the cheapest ones. So I'm not blaming you for anything. I just want to inspire you to see steel as an innovation material because it's by far the, one of the most sophisticated materials for a cradle-to-cradle society. So we have been doing already a Model U with Ford. So we could start immediately in Brazil to show how the future looks like. If you want, yeah. Leah Geyer is here. She can coordinate your work in it. So it's only your spirit. Yeah. And we have the CEO of Ford Motor Company doing cradle to cradle already 21 years. We still case before. And we have Bill Ford supporting it. Oh, by the way, do you know why, uh, how I met Bill Ford? <laughs> it was funny. I was giving a conference in Detroit and giving a talk about the same audience like here. And I was talking about design for reincarnation. Yeah. And I said, look, mm, Americans already have 80% of what is necessary. Yeah. Then Bill, Bill Ford stood up and said, this is not true. Yeah. We have three times more waste than Europe. We have two and a half times more energy. How can we have 80% of what is necessary? Yeah. Then I said, OK, I will tell you later. Yeah. And then my neighbor said, hey, this guy pays for the whole thing here. Yeah. He pays for the show. I yeah. said, OK, then I will tell you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's simple. People in the United States, they live in the car. Yeah. The car has names. Yeah. It's a living room for them. So Americans is an in-car nation. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I said, oh, it's very simple. Now you, you add an re, then it's re-in-car-nation. Yeah. And can you imagine I got standing ovations by 500 people for this stupid joke? Yeah. That only works in the United States, OK? <laughs> <laughs> so this is what we can do code codings. Yeah. Why don't you put the information about the steel alloy in the code? We need to stop welding uh, different alloys together. We can use clues. Yeah, I can sh show you clues. Connecting steel by clues makes far more stronger connection. And we can use enzymes which eat the, uh, the clues. And then you can filter off the, the different components. And then you get your alloy back. Yeah? You get your specific steel alloy back, not scrapyard things and downcycling. No, you get your steel alloy. And, and we did this with Ford. It's a code coding. Yeah, so this allows that you can get the, it's the alloy back, not the mixture and making building steel out of it. So we can do this differently. Look, we now have a washing machine of the, on the market. You're no longer buying a washing machine. You buy 3,000 times of washing. Now, instead of 150 different cheap plastics, we can use 10 plastics, 9 plastics for a washing machine because you only pay per wash. But it's not about durability, it's about defined use period. And in digital world, you need to define the use period what you have for. We can make buildings like trees. Yeah, we can grow algae. Yeah, if you grow algae in compared to beef, yeah, when you eat, when you eat a, 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 a cow, you only pick up about 20% of the protein. People like it, but it's stupid from eating. 
I, I, I enjoy that to eat a steak on a Sunday, but to have your daily hamburger is just stupid. If you grow algae, it's 80 times more productive than growing corn, yeah? and, you don't, and you can use the vaults, and you can use steel endlessly to do these elements. Yeah? It's 80 times, and when, and, and when you eat it, you pick up more than 70% of the protein. So we can, it, this is all where we can have new markets for steel applications. We can change this for the world. And by the way, uh, we are recovering nutrients already. Uh, I, in, my colleagues and I did in O Instituto Ambiental more than 150 sewage treatment systems where we reuse the nutrients from favela areas. We started in Rio de Janeiro in 92 for the Rio conference. And I can tell you the crime rate in these favelas goes down for more than 90%. When, when people feel accepted, yeah, they don't kill each other, they don't cannibalize each other, when they feel safe. Yeah? So let's celebrate life on this planet, not look at a child and say, it's better you're not here. Could you minimize your footprint? No, but how nice that you're here. Let's celebrate us. We can make trees, it, it, and this is all steel applications for that. We can make city trees which support life. We can make artificial trees that steel, yeah, which we need for that. We can get the carbon dioxide back out of the air. Why don't we try to say, hey, in 2100, we will have the same carbon dioxide at, in the atmosphere than we had in 1900. This is a positive thing for my students. They don't want to be less bad. They want to be good. Yeah. So let's celebrate life. I showed it in different events. There's a cradle to cradle congress in Lüneburg next month. And for young students, I, I would pay for some fellowships as well, because we need to work together. We need the Latin American approach for that. We need the fun, we need the beauty, the inspiration of that. So if you have young students, just let me know, and then maybe we can sponsor them. So there's a big conference. So this is a cradle to cradle economy, not a circular economy. Circular economy is, is just thinking yeah, like London Eye, doing the same thing over and over again. This is bloody boring, like sustainability. So let's make a footprint which is beneficial. Our institute headquarters is based in Hamburg, but as you know, we have a lot of colleagues here, and one of the best and nicest ones here definitely is Leah here. You can ask her, we worked together for so many years. And this is how we can use 40 years of blame and shame as an innovation opportunity. But this means really rethinking steel, Thinking, see, seeing steel as an innovation opportunity. It's not about low, uh, great steel and high grade steel, no. It's about reinventing steel, reinventing coatings. Yeah. It's not about just taking a few heavy metals out of it. It's about how we can see steel as a, as a material of the future. Right now, steel recycling is amazingly primitive. I really feel sorry for all these engineers. Yeah. What should they tell their families that they lose all these rare elements, really? It's primitive. I cannot motivate any student with that. No, think about steel as a technical nutrient, as a cradle-to-cradle -cradle material. And we could do this together with Ford Motor Company. We could do this with Volkswagen as well. But it's up to you. Now, we can now really make a difference. But it means it needs just it's an inspiration. I'm not the know-it-all. I need your support. I need to work together with you. Let's have fun together. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, when I said we are better than yesterday, worse than tomorrow, I think you showed it clearly. So we still have a long, a long way to go. So really inspiring. Then I would invite Peter Levy to, to the floor, please. I just só lembrando todo mundo as as perguntas devem ser feitas aí por escrito. As recepcionistas estão aí para para coletar as. Hi everyone. <coughs> I apologize for not being able to speak Portuguese. Um, you're stuck with me, I'm afraid, on that, on that front. I'm here today to talk about the IEA's upcoming iron and steel global roadmap for the industry. Um, and before I start, I'd like to thank my uh, chair, Federica, and uh, my co-panelist, Michael, Professor Bulgart, um, and to the Brazilian Steel Institute for uh, inviting me to speak. Um, so I thought I'd just provide a bit of background on the International Energy Agency itself uh, before I got started. 
um, um, for those of you who are less familiar with it. So um, the IEA was uh, formed in 1974 after the 1973 oil crisis. Um, it was founded with a, a primarily an energy security mandate and the aim was to uh, collect data and in, in engage various mechanisms for making the oil consuming countries of, at the time uh, more resilient to supply price shocks, supply side shocks and price spikes. It's housed at the OECD, uh, hosted by the OECD in Paris, um, and this energy security mandate has gradually broadened over time to encompass all aspects of the energy trilemma. So that's energy affordability, energy uh, sustainability, and energy security. Um, and, in, and in expanding that role, the aim is for the IEA to become the global clean energy hub. Um, and to do this, it needs to work well outside its, um, its membership. Closer? <laughs> cool. um, so the IEA has been working with several countries beyond its membership, as this map shows. Um, and what being the global clean energy hub means is providing countries with the analyses and data that they require in order to affect the clean energy transition and transition to a world in which we're using clean energy uh, rather than uh, emitting, emitting energy, CO2 emitting energy. So in order to do these analyses, we need to establish where we're transitioning from. That's a very important kind of starting assessment. And one uh, indicator that obviously we keep a close eye on is uh, CO2 emissions from the energy system. Um, and this graph shows that in gigatons per year uh, from the millennium. And we can see a, a steady uptick in, uh, in emissions. An encouraging pause or even slight decline in 2009, but sadly this was to do with the global financial crisis, not any technological evolution, and that's, that's not a great way to reduce emissions. Um, then a plateauing uh, in 2014 for three years, um, and then unfortunately an, an uptick to an all-time high in 2017 to around 33 gigatons of CO2 uh, from the energy system. The next question we need to ask ourselves in these analyses is uh, where do we need to get to in the long term? So where are we starting from and where do we need to get to? And to do this, the IEA carries out integrated assessments of the entire energy system, um, taking into account how various aspects of the energy system interact and feeding these into coherent scenarios. Um, the reference technology scenario, the RTS, is an example of one of these. Um, and this projects forward the amount of emissions from where we are roughly today um, to, uh, to, the, to 2050, 2060, the long-term uh, future of the emissions trajectory, based on a kind of extension of current trends. Um, and then the two degrees scenario, which hopefully lots of you will be familiar with, is a scenario in which we aim to limit global mean temperature rise to two degrees and obtain a 50% chance of doing so. And then the modeling is about working out how we do this um, in these scenarios at, uh, at least cost um, and which, which uh, levers need to be pulled in which areas of the energy system. And so I won't go into this in great detail, but this shows a, a broad set of levers are required to deliver those uh, emission savings. The other key activity that links more to what I'm, the core thing I'm talking about today is um, we look as an agency at key aspects, specific elements within, in, within the energy system, how are they doing at the moment? Um, and how are they doing in the short to medium term in order to get to that long term picture that, we, that I showed on the previous slide? Um, and this is at the technology detail kind of level, individual conversion devices um, and end use devices for energy consumption and the sectoral level for industry. Um, so tracking clean energy progress is now primarily a digital offering from the IEA. You can go to this website. I won't, don't have time to navigate it now, but you can click through all of these uh, different aspects of the energy system and see how we think they're doing at the moment. Um, what latest progress on various projects has been, uh, policy developments, but primarily focus on the, on the technology and how they're tracking progress against where we need to be in the short to medium term. As you can see, lots are not on track. Red, red dots indicate that. The next thing uh, that I'd like to talk about is the, is the main uh, topic of the, 
of the presentation is the technology roadmaps that we produce for these individual sectors, taking an even deeper look than the previous slide, than tracking clean energy progress, where we produce a publication normally uh, looking at a specific sector or um, type of technology within the energy system. Uh, the IEA technology roadmap series started back in 2009 and around, I think it's 22, have been produced uh, so far with another 11 or so uh, how-to guides. How-to guides are uh, guides for countries to take uh, higher detailed looks at specific technologies within a national or re regional boundary, um, translating the experience gained at the global picture that we've provided down to a kind of more relevant context for that region. Uh, this activity is, was re-endorsed at the G7 and uh, energy ministerial in 2016 um, and this has spawned a new wave of roadmaps um, that we are commencing with at the moment. Um, so again same principles as before, long-term vision in the roadmaps um, but with a focus on the actions and technologies and key pieces of development that need to be uh, secured in the in the short to medium term 2020-2030 um, and we partner with the relevant organizations and constantly engage with stakeholders throughout the process of developing roadmaps. The most recent updates to the series have been in smart energy systems, bioenergy, and then cement is the most recent industrial sector that we've looked at. Um, this was uh, released just a few months ago. The roadmaps are free, so you can download them from the IEA website and take a look at them. New titles, the main one I want to talk to you about today is the Iron and Steel Global Sector Roadmap. Um, and then we're looking at various other titles there that you can see, cooling and refrigeration, and a how-to guide for solar energy. This uh, slide just outlines the process of how we go about, what questions we ask when we're developing the framework, the scope, um, the technological scope and the geographical scope for, for a given roadmap, for a given study. Um, what uh, types of um, dynamics we consider within the energy system within the sector when we're looking at how the technologies compete, what constraints are there on, on various technologies, um, and how these technologies interact with the wider energy system is always taken into account based on our strength in modeling the whole energy system in other activities that we look into. And then the last component is prioritizing which actions are actionable today and in the short to medium term to set us on the right trajectory. And throughout all of these stages, stakeholder engagement is, is key for getting uh, roadmaps and recommendations that are actionable and are um, able to be carried out by the industry in question or the region in question. Looking on the, on the industry front, on the energy intensive industry front, which is what I focus on in my role in the IEA, um, first global cement roadmap was done in 2009, which was updated then in 2018, the, very recently, um, and a regional cement roadmap was provided for India um, in collaboration with the uh, Indian chapter of the system Cement Sustainability Initiative. Um, and this, as you can see, this links to the segment on the pie chart of final energy consumption, indicating the shares of energy that uh, each of these sectors, industrial sectors, um, are responsible for. Uh, the chemical sector, a look at the role of catalysis in the chemical sector in reducing emissions and getting us to a more sustainable trajectory was looked at in 2013. Um, and then the Global Island Steel Roadmap is next. So moving to the sector, the iron and steel sector specifically, here are some just very high level indicators that we kind of use to scope the um, roadmap a bit, the kind of main foci of the roadmap. Um, we've got final energy consumption here on the left for the iron and steel sector. This is from um, IEA ETP uh, analyses in 2014 data shown on this, um, on this slide. Um, although we can see electricity playing a role in the electric arc furnace secondary route of steel production playing an important role there on final energy consumption, the sector's energy consumption is dominated by coal. It's the largest coal consuming uh, sector among energy intensive sectors. This of course has a a significant emissions consequence, um, leading the iron and steel sector to be the most, uh, the largest emitter among energy intensive sectors. It's second on uh, the uh, energy consumption basis in 2014 after the chemical and petrochemical sector. 
And then the final pie chart uh, just provides you with information that lots of you in the room will be very kind of uh, already well aware of. The rough share between um, uh, primary routes and secondary routes and then this sliver of uh, DRI, I believe most of that capacity is in, in India. So looking at the specific strategies that we will explore in obtaining this uh, wedge of emission savings that I showed at the global level earlier, um, we've got the, the goal in the middle of this diagram here, and then four clusters, main clusters of, uh, of mitigation options that we want to look at in, in the modeling. Of course, these all interact, and they are all dependent on each other, and that's the, that's the um, complexity that's involved in, in modeling these sectors is to make sure we're not doing any double counting or not considering trade-offs of one strategy versus another. And then there are, of course, some wider system level um, benefits and disbenefits that need to be considered, trade-offs with what, what else is happening in the rest of the energy system. There's been several presentations mentioning uh, aspects of interactions with the energy system, whether it's the power sector or byproducts that are produced in the steel industry that are used elsewhere. These are things that need to be considered in, um, and what the impact of implementing various strategies will be on these uh, system level benefits. So just to go into a couple of these um, clusters of levers in a bit more detail, we've got uh, the efforts to reduce the energy intensity of production. In this case, on this graph, pig iron production is shown here, just the iron making phase. And uh, over the last 200 years, this graph shows the s several order of magnitude increase in production, but also this uh, really steep decline in, in energy intensity um, from well over 120 uh, megajoules per kilogram or gigajoules per ton down to, you know, in, in uh, Throwing, throwing distance of the thermodynamic limit in, in the broader context of um, the energy intensity trajectory. And then there are some figures here provided on the right um, that show the, the various energy intensities at different scopes within the sector, the average energy intensity and then the average blast furnace primary route. Um, and we can see that although we've made huge progress and the industry has made huge progress over the last two centuries in reducing the energy intensity, um, doing away with open hearth furnaces and other inefficient aspects of production. There's also um, a gradual slowing in the amount of uh, reduction that can be obtained as uh, we get closer to the, the thermodynamic limit. And um, we see this in all industrial processes or most industrial processes in the energy intensive industries because these sectors are all very well incentivized to reduce their, their energy consumption by the high share of energy costs. Innovative technologies are something I won't go into in a lot of detail today, but we are holding a workshop tomorrow that um, we intend to have various stakeholders explore these in more detail. Um, but there are basically two clusters of uh, innovative uh, technologies. And we're talking about technologies here that can really affect a step change in, in emissions per unit of uh, steel or iron production. Um, and there are two clusters as we characterize them here, although this is not an exhaustive list. There are those that seek to manage the carbon flows within the steel making process and the iron making process and uh, look, look at ways to um, upfront make it easier to capture the CO2 um, and various other uh, innovative techniques to reduce the CO2 that comes out in the end. The, here are some examples shown at various levels of technology readiness level, um, all of which we're, looking, we're seeking to characterize in our, in our modeling. Um, and part of the consultation process on the roadmap, which we're continuing tomorrow in our workshop, is about making sure we're scoping these uh, options in a uh, kind of bringing options that are at similar levels of development, demonstration, um, and, and forward, and making sure we've we've captured at least a good sample of the portfolio on that front. And then the second cl cluster is uh, ge getting rid of carbon or avoiding the carbon in the first place. So you switching to hydrogen or electrons even as the reducing agents. Something I wanted to touch on as well is another cluster of, of options that we look at under the, the heading of material efficiency. Um, this is uh, 
providing the same material service that steel provides, but by using less material. So this includes things like light weighting and uh, producing um, more of uh, the steel with, with via the secondary route, re like reducing the amount of uh, primary materials that are required per, per unit of uh, steel produced and per unit of service provided, critically. Um, and this diagram shows a kind of a, a snapshot of the supply chain um, in 2008, I believe, and this is from a, from a famous journal, journal paper. Um, and the, the point here, I think one of the points that was made in this article is that um, around a quarter of all steel doesn't actually make it into a product. It's circulated within the steel sector itself and part, forms part of the scrap um, inputs to the secondary route. Um, this is obviously something that can be improved in some instances by more efficient cutting and tessellating of shapes in the, in the cutting stage and rolling stages, um, but also just scrap avoidance throughout the supply chain. So reducing yield losses um, and unnecessary scrap is one material efficiency strategy within the steel sector. There's also an important thing that comes out of considering the, uh, the steel supply chain and the end use goods that steel flows into, which we heard a lot about in the previous panel, um, that we've got to consider about the different ways and services that steel, are provi steel is providing today and the different ways it might provide it in the future. It's very likely that we'll still need mobility and shelter, fund fundamental energy and material services, but the way that materials come to provide these services is likely to change if the, if the last half century is anything to go by. And here's a fun example of an old car and a, and a new car. And then this is a snippet from a slide from our kickoff workshop for the iron and steel roadmap provided by Tata Steel um, that just gives an overview of some of the system-wide benefits that we would be um, looking at in the steel sector and the impact of uh, utilizing carbon flows for various other products outside the steel sector, such as liquid fuels via fissiotrope or methanol production, um, other um, end use cases in the chemical industry, and the big one being polymers, uh, well, big, big two being polymers and fuels. So just to provide a bit more detail on how we actually go about this modeling and how we actually go about creating the roadmap. This is a schematic showing the structure of the, the Energy Technology Policy Division, the ETP Division's modeling fleet that was used to generate that uh, initial uh, global picture that I show you of, showed you of scenario analysis of emissions reductions between the uh, RTS and the 2DS. Fundamentally, at the, at the right-hand side of the diagram, we've got these fundamental energy services. So we've got the um, provision of space heating, water heating in the building sector, uh, shelter, square meters, these kind of model drivers. Um, in the transport sector, these are various, various types of passenger kilometers and ton kilometers provided by different modes within the, within the sector. And then for industry, we have tonnages of materials that are produced. And of course, these provide an on another slice in the diagram would reveal a whole diverse range of material services that these materials provide, but we, we stop at tons of material. Transport and buildings models are simulation models. They take a, account of the existing stock of vehicles and, uh, and square meterage in the, in the global commercial and residential sectors um, and in various modes of transport, aviation, shipping, uh, road transport, of course. And then the industry model is composed of five models that are cost optimization models of individ individual energy intensive subsectors, of which steel is one. Also chemicals, pulp and paper, aluminium and cement are the other, other four. These models are run in parallel um, and optimized within the sectors based on cost to deliver their share of uh, CO2 emission savings. And the rest of industry is simulated um, with a, a simulation model that uh, works more based on um, fuels and uh, generic services provided by motors and heaters and so on, um, rather than sp specific uh, activity drivers like tons of material. 
And then all of this interfaces with the supply side model, which is a model that contains the refining sector, the power sector, preparation of other fuels, coal, biofuels. And this again is a cost optimization model that subject to a series of demands provided to it by the end use sector models, um, calculates the optimal um, provision of each of these uh, final energy carriers and provides prices to the end use models so that the end use models can make decisions about which fuel they want to use more of or less of. Oh, sorry. And then this is a more detailed characterization of the industrial sector models, so the types of parameters uh, that we're seeking stakeholder engagement to better inform and that we take a good sort of four to six months of the modeling process is, is about informing these parameters and bringing them up to date from whenever we last updated them. Um, this is, involves making material demand projections, um, which we, of course, like consult the industry that we're working on. We consult the main stakeholders within that industry to get their opinions and impressions about saturation rates, about is there, is there gonna be any structural change that we heard about from World Steel earlier? about the, the way steel might be used in the future and how intensively it might be used in economies that are still developing. These are all important considerations for developing demand projections. Um, this is fed into with other, various other parameters to the optimization model itself in which the model selects from a host of characterized technologies for producing steel um, and these technologies compete on a least cost basis based on investment and fuel costs. And the model puts together a portfolio of technologies in each region of the model for delivering a given level of climate ambition, usually characterized by our scenarios such as the two degree scenario. And these are showing, this slide's showing the three scenarios that were produced for the three sets of results that were produced for the last Energy Technology Perspectives publication. So just to wrap up the presentation with um, the next steps in the iron and steel roadmap, we, um, we have started the, we had the kickoff workshop for the roadmap in November in Paris last year at our offices. Um, this involved stakeholders from across the world in the steel industry. Um, world Steel were in attendance as well. We then had a um, parallel workshop that wasn't specifically to do with the iron and steel sector. Um, itself, but it was looking at an aspect of material demand projection that we are trying to improve at the IEA uh, by looking at material demands trends in specific end use sectors and s talking about how they will change for the main end use materials for, so for, for cement and steel. Um, so that was a, a very valuable learning exercise um, there, and that was also in March in Paris. And then my colleague, Araceli fernandez Palas. Um, held the Asian installment of the Steel Experts Dialogue, of which we are having the American installment tomorrow. Um, and uh, then we intend to launch the publication in mid-2019, uh, mid end of quarter two. As I said earlier, the key topics uh, for discussion at the Experts Dialogues are the, uh, the portfolio of technologies that we uh, include in the modeling, and how we can characterize them and what data we can use to do so. Um, obviously, this is uh, something that we've already made quite a lot of progress on, but we, we're always looking to hone our assumptions on that front. And then also a discussion about the uh, enabling and um, enabling regulatory and financial mechanisms that we consider in our recommendation portfolio at the end of the, the publication. Um, and then on, a word on engagement, these roadmaps really are at their strongest when they're th constantly engaging with the uh, industry to which they pertain um, throughout the process of doing them. So this is, a, this is a, key, a key step. And we are looking at doing that at a global level at the moment, but then when we come to produce regional roadmaps, as we did for the cement sector on the slide I showed, um, we, it's looking at uh, collaborating with uh, regional stakeholders um, on the ground who know the specificities of their countries or regions industry. Um, and then a, a, just a, a snippet of three other projects that are not related to steel. I realize this is a, you know, very outside the box here, but um, we've 
talking about the future of petrochemicals at the IEA. This is a, something that our executive director has termed one of the blind spots of the, of the energy industry. So we're taking a, a detailed look at that, and that's nearly finished. That will be launched in September. Again, free, available, freely available on the website. Um, and then a what if project, this is not its official title, but we're looking at two variants of the two degree scenario in which we explore uh, limited uh, CCS deployment and increased material, increased, increasing ambition in the assumptions about material efficiency and what we can achieve on that front. Um, and then as an interim input to Japan's G20 presidency next year, we hope to provide the initial report of the global analysis we're doing of hydrogen. Um, with the final report being released in 2020. So there's a key other industry-related projects that if you have other interests or wear other hats and other industry, feel free to get in touch with me about those. Last slide, I think, is about the energy uh, Clean Energy Transitions Program at the IEA. This is a cross-divisional uh, initiative um, involving people across statistics, all the modeling teams, uh, energy efficiency division, and we're looking at the actual implementation and effective rollout of the things that we look at in our analyses uh, in specific uh, countries, key countries that we're um, looking to um, foster the clean energy transition. And Brazil is one of these, so I thought I'd highlight that. Thank you very much for listening, and uh, yeah, happy to take your questions in the, in the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Bom, vamos para as perguntas aqui. É, a primeira delas aqui do Guilherme da Celomital para o Peter Levícios. Só dá o um tempinho que ele colocar o fone aqui. Vamos lá. É, como o senhor avalia a possibilidade de suprimento de energia nuclear como fonte principal para atender as demandas futuras da Free CO2 Energy? Working? Cool. Um, yeah, so and the, uh, the, the question was about whether nuclear energy is, is uh, playing an important role in... in the yeah. Um, the, the, uh, whether nuclear energy is uh, providing a, an important lever for decarbonizing energy provision in the future. Um, and the answer is yes in our scenarios. It's one of, uh, one of the levers that uh, I showed in, in one of our slides at the beginning of the presentation um, that's a key lever for transitioning between the, where we're headed currently and where we're headed in the future. There's, of course, uh, different regional trends that happen with each technology. And I believe nuclear, um, one of the strongest growth regions, I think, in the latest modeling results is China. Um, but I, yeah, I, I would need to look into the specifics of the results for, for any regional, regional comment. And these are all available, I would say, online. The Energy Technology Perspectives publication and its accompanying data set are available. Older editions are available for free, but the latest edition can be purchased from the, the IEA bookstore. Ok, é, uma pergunta aqui da Priscila Teixeira, pesquisadora, para o Michael Baumgarten. É, a economia circular deixou de ser uma visão do futuro e está se tornando uma realidade. Quais são, em sua opinião, os maiores desafios especificamente para a indústria do aço? So, so the biggest problem for the steel industry is that they see sustainability as a cost instead of talking about innovation opportunities. Look, um, if, if, I really, you really need to distinguish between efficiency and effectiveness. This is highly efficient, but it's stupid. So there are 10 million tons of plastic going into the ocean. Why don't you say, we want to have metal, we want to have steel as a packaging material. This will be higher weight, but it can be used endlessly. So it's more that the steel industry is looking backwards. If you still calculate about tons, 24 million tons of steel, <laughs> instead of understanding it's about a digital world needs a, 
a defined steel composition and it needs it as a technical nutrient. So it's about that since the industry is fighting against plastic, against aluminum, against carbon fiber, instead of really focusing on the strengths of the material. Look, um, think about everything what is efficient. It's ugly. Think about falling in love with somebody efficiently. Yeah. Think about uh, Mozart being efficient. Uh, culture is never efficient. Everything what is fun is not efficient, but effective. For example, when you have a, yeah, your, a girlfriend is angry about you, 50 roses are completely inefficient, <laughs> but very effective. Yeah. Or think about a lipstick. A woman in Brazil eats about 6.3 kilograms of lipstick during her lifetime. Yeah. Completely inefficient, but very effective, I can tell you. Yeah. So, uh, steel, uh, 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 how can you talk about a low carbon steel? So stupid. Did you ever see a low carbon tree? Yeah. So, it, this doesn't make sense. It's, it, we need to say, look, the more critical thing is not the energy side, it's a material side. When I was a child, a copper ore had 3.5% of copper. Now we are down to 0.1%. Yeah. So steel can be used endlessly as a service yeah, to provide an, a use of the steel as a service. But then you need to design it. And the biggest problem is that you didn't look at the coatings, yeah, how, what is the paint on it, uh, the biggest problem is that you are not having enough self-esteem in the industry. You are thinking somehow, oh, we are sorry, we are history, and we are defined, uh, it, uh, de de uh, defending our territory, and we are losing more and more market share. Instead of saying, hey, we are the material of the future. Steel is the ideal cradle-to-cradle -cradle material. So why don't you say, we do a cradle-to-cradle -cradle car, we do a cradle-to-cradle -cradle building, we do cradle-to-cradle -cradle packaging, and we are the innovation of the future because this is a technical nutrient forever. But this is why you need to look for the components, not just for the material, because the real value of the material is in the component. This is why you need to connect these materials, not by welding processes, by, by clues, because then you can, uh, can destroy the clues by enzymes, you put it in an enzyme bath, and then you can filter the components and you can get the components out. And this makes the steel so much more valuable because you don't make primitive building steel. So you should immediately start and say, we don't do any building in Brazil yeah, for building steel, which has copper, molybdenum, manganese, molyb uh, vanadium, antimony, cobalt in it, because it destroys the integrity of the building steel. Yeah. So just the industry needs to have a little more self-esteem. This is enough because the quality is ideal. Plastic always only can be downcycled, but steel can be even upcycled, not just recycled. So e the energy side we will fix, but the material side is far more critical and steel is the ideal material for the future. And if you understand that, you will attract the smartest young people to join the steel industry, and then the steel industry will be the innovation hub for the country. Está funcionando? Tá. Bom, é, uma pergunta aqui para o Peter. Como o roadmap, que é aquele que se apresentou ali no slide das corzinhas, né? Como que esse roadmap vai considerar? as peculiaridades de cada mercado, de cada país. É, como que ele trata isso e as vantagens competitivas? Eu estou imaginando aqui, né? a gente viu o colega da, da Fiat Chrysler aqui comentar que no Brasil vai muito pelo etanol, outros países estão indo para o aço carro elétrico, ou seja, essas particularidades, como que elas são abordadas no roadmap? Absolutamente. Então, há uma pergunta muito longa para essa pergunta, que eu vou tentar condensar. Um, the, the model fleet that I gave a brief overview of there has uh, 
multiple regions in it. In, in industry, we model 39 regions in the world separately. Um, this includes lots of individual countries, but then for smaller uh, countries in the industrial landscape, i.e. those that don't produce much in each industry, are clustered together to form 39 for the world. In each region, the uh, various technologies that are available um, are using price signals from the supply sector, so for bioethanol, for example, or for electricity, or for coal and natural gas, um, to look at which, uh, which technology option would be most beneficial in that context. I would, so that's how the kind of regional nuance is handled in, in the models. What I would add to that, though, is that these scenarios are not, they're not meant to be perfect predictions of the future. They're not really meant to be predictions at all. They're meant to be based on a set of assumptions, in the case of the reference scenario, based on a, a set of assumptions about how we've consumed energy today and how, we, how policies indicate we might um, consume it in the future within a given sector, what, what is likely to happen or what could happen given those assumptions. The, the two degrees or climate mitigation scenarios are, are very different. We work backwards from a goal. So we want to achieve a level of decarbonization in each region, in each sector, and what technologies are um, cost optimally selected for doing so in the case of industry. So the, the way each technology is selected will be bespoke to, to each region to some extent, but it may not uh, reflect the individual um, uh, statements of each car manufacturer. Ok, obrigado, Peter. Eu vou caminhar para a última pergunta aqui, porque senão a gente não consegue nem fazer as conclusões nos cinco minutos aqui. É, mas, o, o Michael, seria uma pergunta para você sobre... Eu vou pegar e juntar duas aqui. É, a primeira é como que a gente avaliaria a qualidade dos produtos, do, do material reciclado, do aço, no caso daquele exemplo da da Maersk que você deu, né? ou seja, aproveitar aquelas diversas partes, como que a gente avaliaria a qualidade? Pergunta do Guilherme. E a segunda pergunta do Leonardo Samba aqui, que eu acho que ela está um pouco conectada, é, ele comenta né, que a gente precisaria de toda uma mudança de cultura e, principalmente, até uma mudança no produto. Ou seja, os produtores daquele navio, eles já têm que produzir um navio imaginando que vamos ter que dividi-lo em partes e isso ser reaproveitado. Como que a gente faz para fazer essa mudança nos produtos e nos processos para que isso seja valorizado? Porque, né, aqui complementando um pouco a pergunta do colega, é claro que vai ter um custo adicional para fazer isso, e como que a gente vai mostrar o benefício na ponta para que isso seja viabilizado, para que o cradle to cradle se torne uma realidade? Então, isso é por isso que não é cradle to cradle, é cradle to cradle. And this is why this is the ideal material. And your institute first should come up with a list of pigments, coatings, additives for steel, which you recommend for cradle to cradle. You could do a positive list. It doesn't help to do the assessment at the end. It makes for more sense to define what is in there. Yeah? If I invite you for dinner, I don't tell you it's free of chicken. I tell you what it is, isn't it? So a good recipe, it's a positive definition of materials, not an assessment at the end. And this means just why don't you want to be the innovation hub? Because look, the president of the country is coming here because this is a key industry for the future. And why don't you say, hey, instead of uh, optimizing the diesel engine, you, know, you say, hey, what is the right uh, way to do a car for the future? And, and this is why it's not about efficiency, but about effectiveness. And you can make a strength out of things that you are at the beginning of innovation. And as I said, why don't you really want to get in touch with Ford Motor Company and said, we want to do a cradle to cradle car here in Brazil. Why do you always wait for the northern countries where you have the spirit, you, know, you have the fantasy, you have the best architects in the world here, the most creative ones. So why don't you come up and say building steel is made out of iron and out of carbon, and that's it. That makes far more for, for the climate on the longer term than just reducing a little carbon footprint and minimizing the energy for that, because it's only extra costs if you do so. 
And if you say, we want to do the cradle to cradle with car for the future, the cradle to cradle building for the future, the cradle to cradle packaging for the future, then your institute is the key because you can facilitate and moderate. And Europe is going into this cradle to cradle circular economy now because it saves a lot of costs. But in a digital world, you need to define the use period of the steel. And when you make a steel insurance, instead of selling the steel, you can save a lot of cost because you can use the best materials, not the cheapest materials. And then you don't do filters at the end for the secondary smelters. As I said, the secondary steel smelters are the biggest single sources of pollution in the world. So why should you make filters when you can design it from the beginning that the, the additives, the pigments, the, the, the paints are designed for the secondary smelters. So it's up to you, it's an offer. I came here only for this conference, yeah, only. And, but I minimized my carbon footprint by going to the toilet before I entered the airplane. Yeah. So if everybody would empty his digestion system before entering an airplane, it would save from Frankfurt to Sao Paulo five tons of kerosene. Yeah. So you can be really be a little less bad. Isn't it good? Yeah. But less bad is no good. It's just a little less bad. And for being less bad, we are too many. This is why I ask you about an innovation opportunity. And so don't see the steel industry of the historic thing. We, like Pittsburgh, you have to defend somehow. No, it's the future. Steel is the future. And please be a part of that future. Thank you very much. É, depois teve uma pergunta para mim aqui, eu vou comentar brevemente. É, a pergunta da, do Aristides aqui é por que no Brasil ainda não reciclamos carros sucateados? O IBR pode fazer algo? Bom, a resposta é a gente já, já sim, já sucateamos, né? Isso existe esse procedimento. É, agora, tem toda uma discussão da, da idade da frota brasileira, a necessidade de renovação. Né? É claro que se renovar uma frota com dois, três anos não faria sentido, você gera mais CO2 para produzir o um novo veículo do que você está tirando da rua, mas na hora que você chega em veículos que a gente vê rodando, aí realmente o Brasil tem um tem que fazer um trabalho numa renovação de frota. Esse é um trabalho que o Aço Brasil é, estuda sim, está na nossa pauta aqui, mas a resposta é que a gente já, já recicla. Bom, e aí eu queria só partir para o fechamento aqui, né? agradecer a as, os, a, os insights que a gente teve dos nossos dois colegas aqui. É, eu acho que do Michael, eu queria lembrar, né, ele comenta, do não sei se a tradução seria berço to be, do berço ao berço, acho que sim, né, cradle to cradle, é, mas eu acho que isso é um passo a mais na economia circular. né ele É a hora que a gente comenta que pensar na pintura que você vai usar num produto para que ele seja reciclado na ponta, é, eu acho que isso tem que passar a ser valorizado, sim. né? A gente deveria ter produtos que nós pensássemos em como eles vão é, ser reaproveitados no futuro. Eu acho que, apesar de, como eu disse, né, hoje estamos melhores do que ontem, piores do que amanhã, eu acho que o, esse próximo passo para amanhã tende a ser esse aí, né? caminhar para para que seja realmente uma economia circular. Depois ele abordou um pouco um lado inovativo do serviço, isso é um fato, né? a gente... É, aqueles produtos, a, a máquina de lavar roupa, alguns exemplos que ele deu de que a gente, aquilo se um dia virar um serviço, a gente vai estar tá caminhando para uma, uma sustentabilidade. E por fim, a parte que eu mais gostei foi do orgulho que nós temos que ter do nosso produto. Né? É, realmente, eu acredito também que é, um, é o produto do futuro. Ele é reciclável N vezes, a, é, o plástico, todo mundo já recebeu nas redes sociais o vídeo daquilo acumulando, não sei aonde, e realmente o aço, pela sua facilidade de reciclar, é, a gente sabe que ele está bem melhor nesse aspecto aí. Então, sim, eu fecharia do Maico aí com o orgulho que eu tenho e que eu espero que cada um de vocês tenha e divulgue o nosso produto, que ele realmente tem esse apelo aí. Depois o Peter, eu acho que ele deu para a gente um olhar bem estruturado de como que a, o, a emissão de CO2 se, re, se correlaciona com a energia. né Nosso setor, como ele mostrou claramente na apresentação, é um setor altamente intensivo em uso de energia, e eu acho que o roadmap dele mostra um pouco a importância desse assunto aí para nós. Bom, com essas palavras eu fecharia os dois, os, as palestras mais uma vez agradecendo. E queria só encerrar lembrando, né, a gente, cada um de nós aí tem a, a rotina que temos, a agenda que temos, é, e o fato de eu estar hoje coordenando esse painel me fez estudar com um detalhe que eu nunca tinha estudado os nossos é, relatórios de sustentabilidade. A gente sempre lê, sempre folheia, pega os principais pontos, mas eu acho que ele, é, ele 
é um relatório interessante para ser lido, para nós termos como objetivos para as nossas indústrias, para o nosso setor. É, colhido ali uma série de coisas que eu vou levar, e eu convido cada um a baixar o, o, o relatório, ou pelo menos lê-lo, como eu disse, ele já está bem mais amigável na, para ler em qualquer plataforma. Então, fica aqui o meu... A meu apelo e lembrança para cada um de vocês para ler o relatório. Bom, mais uma vez, muito obrigado aos nossos palestrantes e obrigado à atenção de todos vocês aí.